Hi friends, welcome back to another video slash episode of the James Red Podcast. My lights are smart lights. They have been turning off in the last few seconds randomly. Now they're red. <laughs> okay. So this is what happens. These lights are connected to the internet. My wife has the ability to change the lights from wherever she is on the planet. It's amazing. They're amazing. <laughs> They're, they are, <laughs> oh my God, it's, a, it's an amazing technology. However, I'm trying to record a podcast, so I decided I'm going to embrace this, and this is just going to be hilarious for a little bit. Let me see if I can switch it back, and let's see how long that lasts. Oh, now, see, i got to go through all these process. You know what? It's going to be, I want it to look okay, you know? I don't want it just to be red the whole time. I don't want a Russian dance club. Oh my gosh, it's blue. Stop being blue. Oh, no, no, I did that. Okay, hi friends. So I always say that all art forms inspire all art forms. Meaning, if you sat down all of the art forms at the table of art, they would have a lively conversation, sharing inspiration and insights. Every, every one of them has something to bring to the table. Oh my gosh, is that where that phrase comes from? I want to talk specifically about the ideas of organizing many elements into order, uh, using light thoughtfully, organizing people in the scene, and I also believe that the elements of art tend to be fundamentally pleasing to the mind, right? So there's a reason why the rule of thirds exists. It, it fundamentally interacts with our brain. But very quickly before I jump into this and before I talk about a couple of paintings that are actually famous paintings and uh, share things I think are interesting about them and what we can pull from them as, as photographers or any art form. So, so you know, uh, I have been very frustrated with Verizon ads for at least s the foreseeable past, right? Now, today I saw a Verizon ad that was too... Girls, I believe it was, sitting in an airport, they had trouble connecting their phones to, to you know, some sort of interaction. It was very important, I'm sure. And they go, oh, no, we're having trouble. Then the skinny white guy who's in all the Verizon commercials, in a very awkward fashion that for some reason is supposed to be funny to us. But I, I don't know how this this made it through the round of meetings that it takes to make a commercial. Like, I've been in that industry. I don't... Well, I, I kind of do. Okay. So, so, you know, he takes off his blindfold. They're sitting in an airport. He says, he says, well, that's, uh, you know, that is because you, dro you dropped your network. With Verizon, you wouldn't drop the network. And then you see behind him that, in, like in every commercial... They have the enormous Verizon logo in, th in three dimensions sitting in the airport. Now, for one, this interrupts me. This commercial interrupts me. It is heavily stupid. It's not funny. There's nothing interesting about what he's saying. There's nothing, there, there's nothing humorous about what he's saying. It's like they're trying really hard. And for whatever reason, the status quo right now in... The world of, t of uh, uh, advertising is to put awkward people on the TV, but it's, but it's like forcefully awkward, so it doesn't make any sense. And then you have the Verizon logo in the middle of the, the walkway of the airport. Have you ever been to an airport? It's hard enough when, when everything is clear, when there's not someone on the floor, uh, you know, convulsing from, from some seizure or, there's, or someone vomited, right? When you put a giant Verizon logo in the middle, you're not helping your consumers. You're not helping anyone. That's my problem with Verizon. But, uh, I mean, they, they do have good service. Okay, so, first off, I want to talk about a painting from um, a guy named Edward Hopper. Now, Edward Hopper it was born in uh, July 22nd, 1882, and he, uh, he, died. he died May 15th, 1967. He has a very famous painting called Nighthawks. And uh, so this painting, here we have a scene from the perspective of the outside of a diner at night. And you have a fluorescent light lighting the inside of the diner and spilling over to the outside. We have four people inside the diner with interesting semi-absent expressions. 
they aren't engaging with each other, which creates a lot of intrigue. And I don't want to break down this, this, I don't want to break down all the intricacies of this. Uh, there's actually a video by Nerdwriter, a very popular fellow on YouTube, fantastic video. I'm actually going to show you some of that video right now because he, he breaks this down in tremendous fashion, and then I'll share my thoughts. Edward Hopper is a special artist for a lot of us. I've always thought of him in a sort of aromatic way, because his paintings evoke the same kind of feelings and memories in me that I get from the sense of smell, as if he was channeling directly into my limbic system, excavating moments that were stored deeply away. A stubborn realist throughout the many changing and often abstract currents of modern art in the early and mid 20th century, his canvases are clean, smooth, and almost too real. Not real like his contemporary Andrew Wyeth, for example, who strived for detail and photorealism, but pulled back by one degree into depictions slightly more generalized, slightly more detached from place, history, and person. In this way, there's just enough room to put your own life into Hopper's work. But once inside, it's impossible not to be closed in and see that life along his themes. Nearly all those themes are present in Nighthawks, unquestionably the artist's most famous work. Themes of loneliness, alienation, voyeurism, quiet contemplation, and more. The scene depicts four people in a New York City diner at night. It's meant to be somewhere in Greenwich Village where Hopper lived, but decades of exhaustive searching have concluded that it was never a real place. There is one waiter and three patrons whose relationships are all ambiguous. Seated so close together in an empty diner at night, it's likely that these two know each other somehow. But though their hands overlap, they don't touch, and their indifferent faces suggest that they could be strangers, if not just momentarily estranged. The main character of the piece seems to be the diner itself, an island of light in the outer darkness. Its diagonal lines are strong, accentuated by the counter and the stools. And we're seeing the diner at an odd angle, as if from the vantage of someone crossing the street. Its triangular corner juts into the frame like the prow of a boat. And this is no coincidence, not only was Hopper obsessed with the imagery of boats, but he repeatedly situated his buildings at angles like this. And the point of that, I think, was to achieve an effect in which his subjects were both behind and in front of windows. Of course, windows are the place where the separation between outside and inside becomes complicated, and not because we can physically move through them, but because our sight does, because our gaze invades these private worlds. Indeed, in Hopper's work, the windows often appear as if they're not even there. As opposed to someone like Norman Rockwell, who had a talent for giving glass a texture, Hopper's windows vanish. They invite that voyeuristic look, knowing that houses, like people, can be penetrated with a gaze. Hopper was a very slow, very deliberate painter. He took months to finish a canvas and made several sketches and studies before embarking on the final piece. In these sketches for Nighthawks, we can see Hopper out on the street looking for the right back angle for this man, modifying to find the perfect effect. Here's his sketches of Josephine, his wife, who modeled for the woman in the painting. Here's her right hand holding a cigarette, which he eventually transplanted to her partner. Hopper wanted his devotion to each work to be mirrored by our appreciation. As slowly and deliberately as he painted, he wanted us to look, really look, and to be made vulnerable, as a viewer always is, whether he or she is crouching in the dark in the building opposite or simply crossing the street. There's no door to the diner in Nighthawks, no way in except by way of sight. That sight enters the fluorescent light of the establishment, passes through the three patrons in their ennui and loneliness, and exits into the dark, forbidding night behind them. You know, I, I wonder about that darkness. Hopper tried very hard to unmoor his work from the historical moment. He didn't want only to be judged in the context of his time and place. But it's worth noting that this painting was completed in the weeks and days following the bombing of Pearl Harbor, when everyone in New York City was paranoid about another attack. The city held blackout drills, a way to practice hiding the city in darkness if an aerial assault ever came. 
but Hopper didn't care. His studio lights stayed on. As his wife wrote in her diary, Ed refuses to take any interest in the very likely prospect of being bombed. This was the atmosphere in which Nighthawks was born. Did it have an influence on the painting? I don't know. The future was very uncertain at this moment in time, as uncertain as the darkness that frames the patrons of this diner, a darkness they're launched into by Hopper's composition and our gaze. The artist was obsessed with light, how it fell on houses, on people, through windows, the colors it made. Hopper seemed to disregard the chaos in the world around him, but is it a coincidence that, like his studio, the light of the Nighthawk's Diner seems to be the last light still shining in the city. And for this reason, I think you can find a slightly more optimistic reading of this painting. What is there to do in the face of great disquiet and doubt, but work and live on? All of Hopper's people seem to be huddled up against the present moment. Lonely, yes. Waiting, maybe a little bored. The people of Nighthawks are no different. But boredom is exactly when we feel time and being the most acutely. It can inspire a profound mood. Maybe that's what these people are feeling, alone together in their lighted ship, sailing against the darkness of all that was yet to come. The yellowish, greenish, fluorescent light in this scene, like the light in Hopper's studio, is a meager substitute for the brilliance of the sun. But it can, through giant windows, still illuminate the world. Very good, that nerd writer. And he brings to the table, whoa, hey, uh, a, a, an intellectual dynamic that you don't see a lot right now, and I think that's fantastic. So this photo has a beautiful color dynamic, or the painting. <laughs> this painting has a beautiful color dynamic. And you, you, have, you have this interesting play of blue on um, sort of reddish colors that you see splash throughout the scene. And then on the inside, you have this fluorescent light that's lighting up the inside of the diner. The mood is spectacular. It's very somber, uh, but very enthralling. You're pulled into it. It's, it's mesmerizing. And you, you also, you also I, I love the blue shadows in the scene. I, I love this in paintings, I believe, of that era and also in photography. Um, tinting, tinting shadows, a very interesting blue color. I think a lot of that comes in this scene from the fact that the, a lot of the textures are blue themselves. But if you look in the windows, I believe those are also bluish, not just jet black. It really adds to the photo. I love that. A lot of people don't like that. But w what's so interesting about this photo to me, is, oh my God. <laughs> what's so interesting about this uh, painting to me that was made with paint not with real life, is that it feels like the just the best street photo ever, right? I, I, I've always loved this painting. This is something that a photographer, and specifically a street photographer, should strive for in their work to recreate. So um, I want to move on to another painting now by Jacques-Louis David. Now... Uh, Jacques Louis David predated Ed, uh, what was it, Edward Hopper by a lot. He was born August 30th, uh, 1748, and died December 29th, 2016. Just kidding, 1825. And the painting I want to look at today is called The Death of Socrates. And uh, here we have a scene depicting the death of Socrates. So he he uh, he didn't get super abstract and eccentric with his naming here straightforward to the point sometimes you need that in life because life can be way too confusing you know what i mean you know what i mean, you know what I mean? okay here we have a scene depicting the death of socrates and we we have this stone room with a large doorway and you see people all around a lot of interesting expressions and an example of this being his hand resting just above the cup that I believe has the substance in it that would kill him in this scene. Now, I, I, don't, I don't know all the details about this painting. And once again, I must refer to a wonderful Nerd Writer video about this painting as well. 
here that is because he he breaks it down in glorious fashion and i'm going to show a little bit of it i would encourage you to watch the entire thing because it's freaking amazing if you you like art This is The Death of Socrates by Jacques-Louis David. Completed in 1787, it is an exemplar of the neoclassical period in France, which David virtually created and brought to the fore himself. Before I say more, it's important to note just how striking this canvas is, not knowing anything about it. So much jumps out at me right away. The clarity of the scene, the fierce gesture of the man in the middle, the interplay of the chalice and the hand that reaches for it, the angles of the light and the men, the soft draping garments, the bare, flat stone wall. As the title suggests, the scene depicts the death of Socrates, told famously by Plato in his dialogue on the soul, the Phaedo. Socrates had been convicted in Athenian court of failing to acknowledge the gods of the city and corrupting the city's youth, and sentenced to death by drinking hemlock. As Plato makes clear in another dialogue, the Crito, Socrates could have escaped into exile, but instead he chooses to die, taking the opportunity to teach his final lesson, that death is not to be feared by the philosopher, but embraced as an apotheosis of the soul. David chooses to paint the moment just as Socrates is grabbing for the poison draft. He's been discussing at length the immortality of the soul and doesn't even seem to care that he's about to take the implement of his death in hand. On the contrary, Socrates is defiant, gesturing toward the afterlife to which he hastens. David idealizes him. Socrates would have been 70 at the time and somewhat less muscular and beautiful than painted here. The raking light coming in from the top left pours onto Socrates, the brightest figure in the tableau. The colors, muted at the sides, become vivid in the center with the executioner in red and Socrates in white. For David, Socrates is a symbol of strength over passion, of stoic commitment to an abstract principle even in the face of death. But this is the ethical message David sought to offer the French two years before the French Revolution, as the monarchy was in decline and reformers ached to install a democracy akin to that of Socrates' own time in Greek antiquity, or of the United States, which had just executed its own revolution five years prior. Indeed, Thomas Jefferson himself was present at the unveiling of this painting at the Salon of 1787. The image commissioned by two radical political reformers was wildly popular. David had already made his name with another severe moralistic canvas, the Oath of the Horatii, which effectively invented the neoclassical style, taking its cues from the stark simplicity of ancient Greece and Rome, from the ancient obsession with anatomy and musculature, from the two-dimensional friezes depicting historical events. Neoclassicism, as rendered by David, made its points strongly and severely. This was in direct opposition to the dominant Rococo style that reflected the ornate and hedonistic lifestyles of the monarchy. In the Horatii, as in the death of Socrates, those dedicated to principle are depicted with angular geometry, while those ruled by passion are curved and weak. In both canvases, the backgrounds are flat, fixing attention on the foreground where, like a frieze, the action can be read from side to side. One way to read the death of Socrates is right to left. The anguish of Socrates' followers curling and twisting opens up onto the calm expression of the man himself and flows down through his right arm, which hovers over the cup of poison. The space between the hand and the cup, the exact center of the image, is the seat of maximum narrative charge. Then it falls back into the pain of the man who delivers the poison, who turns his gaze away from Socrates, and finally comes to rest on the man sitting at the foot of the bed, unengaged. More on him in a moment. David doesn't identify anyone in the painting, but we can infer from accounts of Socrates' actual death that in the background is Socrates' wife, Xanthippe, led away in distress, and clutching Socrates' leg is Crito, his oldest and most faithful student. Under Crito, we can see that David has signed his own name, signaling a feeling of connection with the man. David, weaker than his ideal of moral strength, nonetheless grabs and strives toward it. 
The painter has taken a number of liberties with history. Besides altering Socrates' face and physique, David decreases the number of people present at the event from over 15 to 12, echoing the number of disciples at Da Vinci's Last Supper. But I think the most significant change is the addition of the character at the foot of the bed. This is Plato the man who popularized Socrates' teachings by staging him as the protagonist in over 30 philosophical dialogues. Put simply, without Plato, there would be no Socrates. The two men melt into each other historically. It's hard to determine where Socrates' philosophy ends and Plato's begins. Not only was Plato absent at the death of Socrates, but he was a young man at the time. Here, David has him as old and withdrawn. I said earlier that you can read the canvas from right to left, but you can also read it from left to right. The whole scene, it seems to me, appears to explode out of the back of Plato's head, recontextualizing it as a memory, an idealized memory in which Socrates gestures in the exact same way he does in Raphael's School of Athens. Significantly, Plato is positioned apart from the flat background where the frozen lateral moment gives way to the depth of time and reality. It strikes me that this is the way memories often fall out, restaged with smooth edges and perfect light, two-dimensional, idealized, painstakingly arranged to serve the needs of the present. In the character of Plato, the rigorous ethical reality of the scene is betrayed by its own self-awareness as a construction. And in only a few short years, the noble ideals of the French Revolution will be betrayed as well by the terror that is to follow. Maybe this is why, almost prophetically, David signs his name here a second time. Neoclassicism like this may seem severe and blunt, but so much is happening in David's Death of Socrates, an interplay of historical, personal, political, and aesthetic elements rendered forcefully, subtly, and beautifully. Put another way, it's a work of genius. Thanks, nerd writer. You say smart things. Now, I think that this painting is an example of taking a lot of elements, and specifically people in this case, and masterfully organizing them into a pleasing dynamic. I think a lot of paintings from this era are a great example of that. Uh, and more, more paintings from uh, Jacques-Louis de Vie are a great exa example of that as well, where you have a tremendous amount of people in the photo uh, that are it, it represents chaos and it's organized into order. Now you also have a really interesting dynamic with the light and the shadow in the frame. Uh, you you have the in, you have the two sort of playing off of each other, where in the foreground you have the light hitting Socrates the hardest. He is the brightest point in the frame, drawing our eye to him. And uh, there are other points in the frame that are that are rather bright as well, that are important points of the frame. And then it sort of fades off. And, and uh, he mentions in his video, Mr. Nerd Writer, that, that the colors sort of fade off into pastels on the edge of the frame and become more vibrant towards the center. I think that's incredibly interesting. But you have a, a beautiful streak of light going across the background on the wall. And then you have a, a tunnel that is... It is very uh, shadowy. And then on the other end of that tunnel, you have another room with a group of people looking in. And their, their contrast to the tunnel has this wonderful, pleasing effect. And these are all uh, principles of the visual arts, right? This is applied in photography uh, again and again and again. Um, and, and overall, you have these dramatic and meaningful expressions and if you if you l listen to the rest of that video all of the expressions in this photo all, what what everybody is doing has such tremendous depth and meaning to to it and but but just on their own they're pleasing right if you not even if you dig in uh let me try that again without even digging into the meaning of all of the expressions that are happening in this photo and what they have to do with the story being told um, the expressions are very dramatic and in engaging. So I want to move on to, I actually want to move on to an artist that is uh, sort of in the same realm, much more recent, <laughs> uh, but he is a guy named Jeff Sheldon, and he makes, 
he has a um, brand called Ugmonk. I wear his shirts in almost every one of my videos, including today. He is a fantastic minimalistic designer. He, he creates beautiful interplays between color. And I, I don't know when he was born and he's still alive. But anyway, I love his work. I have the print that I'm going to be talking about actually right here. Hello. So this, uh, what we're looking at right now is we have a very minimalistic scene of essentially a sun rising over a mountainscape. We have these 45 degree angle blue mountains. And by the way, I must say, when I say very minimalistic, I mean very minimal. This, this entire design is made up of three shades of blue and one shade of like a pale yellow to make the sun. So we have it's a 45 degree angle blue mountain shapes that block the rising sun. The sky is blue. It feels like morning. And it's called day, I believe. So this is a no nerd writer video for this one, <laughs> but um, this is a fantastic example of the very fundamentals of art being organized in beautiful fashion. And like I said, it's very minimalistic and the color balance here is, is beautiful and the color theory here is beautiful. We have an interesting contrast between the sun and all the, the colors of blue and it's an interesting interplay between the, the, the minimalism and how simple everything is. It's an interesting interplay between the design and our imagination. In other words, we have just enough information to, to understand what's going on, but we fill in all the gaps with our imagination. And this has a very pleasing effect. That's it. And I, I find that interesting. I want to look more into that, right? Where you, where you take away so much detail that you just leave. It's like it's almost like a book where you read the words and then you fill in all the gaps with your own imagination. I think that's one interesting effect of minimalism. Now I want to move on to the photography side and kind of bring this all for, full circle, compare everything together. We have now photographer Fan Ho. He was born in uh, October 8th, 1937, died June 19th, 2016, so very recently. Fantastic photographer of, the, I would call him the street variety. And he is a little bit less of the candid, uh, <laughs> uh, let's, let's say, I don't want to call it sloppy. What's the word? Candid? Hmm. I would call it a... a he, well, so what he is, is he is, he has very organized geometrical frames, whereas a lot of street photographers sacrifice a lot of that for the sake of the spontaneity, which is fantastic. And so when I say sloppy, I don't mean that in a negative sense. I just mean sloppy framing intentionally uh, having to do with the type of work that you're doing. So one thing about him in general is that he used very unique angles in his photos. In other words, he's shooting from interesting perspectives and positions. And you also see patterns throughout his work. And he used light very thoughtfully. Now he tells your eye where to go with all of these elements coming together, which is what we were seeing in the, the, the paintings of a few minutes ago. Yester minute. <laughs> uh, but first we have a photo of a woman. I don't know if this one, this one is so beautiful and, and perfect that it feels posed. I'm not sure because all of his other work doesn't have that type of vibe to it. So I'm, I'm not sure and I would, uh, I want to research this photo more, but regardless, it's a great example of a fantastic symmetry and an organi uh, organization of geometric elements as well as light. And it's extremely minimalistic, almost as minimalistic as the print I mentioned a second ago. But we have a woman standing on a wall, back up against the wall, and it's a sort of dark. The, the wall is is this shade of gray, and then we have a brighter shade of gray that is that is beautifully cut in half by a darker shade. And I'm, just, I'm trying to make sure I explain this well. Uh, beautifully cut in half with a darker shade in a diagonal line, and and I find it to be such a wonderful photo. Uh, for the fact that it's hard to find the, well, for one reason, it's hard to find scenes like this in the world. And when you come across them, it's hard to find a person 
there it's hard to to put a person into that scene in a pleasing manner but this is an example of how he took uh the fundamentals of what we were speaking about a second yester minute and applied them to the real world where you don't have a cam you don't have a blank canvas this is an interesting blessing and a challenge of being a painter the, the blessing is that you have a blank canvas you can start wherever you want and finish wherever you want the bad thing is that you you have a blank canvas. Now you're still drawing inspiration from the world. In photography, you're actually capturing the world. You don't start with a blank canvas. You're interacting with the world and hoping for serendipity, right? So this next photo, we have uh, some people walking up and down a staircase, beautiful light, light streams, sh uh, interesting shadows as the light streams hit people. And this is a great example of of grouping and breaking up people to organize chaos in a scene. And in paintings, you can do this at your whim. But in um, photography, this is one of the hardest aspects of photography, where a lot of times people are clumped together in not so interesting fashion. Here we have uh, here we have a photo where he essentially grouped people into not so perfect groups, but semi-perfect groups, enough to where it feels balanced and symmetrical. Also, he, he cut the frame perfectly down the middle with the railing of the staircase in this downtown area. We have two guys looking at each other, straight at each other, sort of their own group at the top of the staircase. Then we have a guy at the bottom of the staircase uh, who is, I, I would consider, sort of the main subject of the photo, even though it's a little bit ambiguous here, right? But uh, his expression... Interesting looking off into the distance. He's carrying uh, some newspapers or scrolls or something of this sort. And like I said, I think this is a fantastic example of breaking up people into interesting groups. I make that sound like you can just take all the people and, and move them around, pick them up and move them around. But it's a little bit harder than that in photography. Uh, this is an example of the next photo is a, a photo of a guy carrying one of those, um, I'm not sure what you call them, but they're the, the sort of hand taxis where the, guy, the person runs with the taxi behind them, sort of carriage type situation. And uh, this is an example of using an interesting angle and perspective to organize all of the elements of a photo. And paintings often utilize angles that only a flying person could achieve. Now in photography, you're a bit limited unless you do have a jetpack, in which case you, if you're trying to be, uh, if you're trying to observe from the, the fringes of the situation, it, having a jetpack will sort of ruin the authenticity of the moment. Everybody's like, oh, oh, is that guy going to shoot us with a laser gun? Um, like Django Fett, right? Reference? Anyone? Seriously? Jingo Fett? Bubba Fett? Okay, carrying on. Uh, so I think that the, what he done well here was he got off the ground a little bit, and then you have the... He, he's, it's a framing that is not particularly perfect, <laughs> in a sense, because... It, He's the guy. The guy with the carriage is sort of in the middle of the photo. Like one, one would try to maybe frame him lower to the bottom, but it really works here. And this is an example of when it's okay to break the rules. But you, you have interesting groupings once again of people: single person over here, small group of people over here uh, <laughs> to the right. Audio listeners to the right, and then you have the guy running. In the background, you have two sort of trolleys. In the, um, in the distance. And like I said, fantastic example of taking, taking, uh, of using the power of perspective to change the overall look of a photo and have a different relationship with the scene that you're looking at. All right, for the next photo, oopsies, I hit my thing here. Don't you hate it when you hit your thing? Oh, there we go. Okay. Oh, this is problematic. Windscreen, guys. Windscreen so they don't pop in your ear canals. Okay, so this, is a, this, is, this photo is a, of a girl with a, it looks like a baby on her back. She's walking into a building. You have these windows that the light is hitting the windows in beautiful fashion. Uh, the windows are lit up. Everything else is very dark. It's a very stark uh, kind of photo. 
Where am I at with my camera? Very good. Yeah, it's a very stark sort of photo. And uh, this is an interesting example of organized light and very intentional framing. He got uh, seemingly down low, I, I would think, in this photo, uh, pointing up quite a bit, using the windows as interesting points um, to, to focus on in the photo. And, and, but it's also not the subject of the photo. The person is the subject of the photo. Beautiful beam of light hitting her, and it stops right after her in the frame, right? So if we're moving towards the background, it stops right after her. She's perfectly placed in the light. And it's, it's a very intriguing photo, a sort of emotional photo, uh, too. And this, this is an example of, of quite a few of the things I've been speaking about already, but, but um, organized light and very intentional framing. Number five is is a is a photo of you've probably seen this one before. It's a very popular photo in photography world. It's a photo of a guy standing on a boat on on a, a rowboat going down the small river in the middle of an urban uh, jungle, if you will. Beautiful foggy light coming down. Interesting geometry. And this is a glorious execution of all of these fundamentals coming together, all of the fundamentals I've been speaking about so far, you know, light, geometry, framing, organization. This is a, a, a rare scene that one can study and apply to less rare scenes <laughs> and also be prepared for when this sort of scene does come along in your life. And you will have scenes like this the longer that you practice the art of photography. But the, the interesting thing about looking at spectacular photos is there are a lot of principles that you can take from that spectacular photo and apply to a much less spectacular scene. So that's it. Uh, I, think that, I think that it's fantastic how all of the art forms inform each other, even music, right? Uh, if you get creative in your thought process, you can take musical influence and apply it. My, my friend Will, who was... Um, you know, I spoke to a couple of podcasts, episodes, and videos ago. He says that when he edits, he likes to, to play a specific type of music because it informs his edits. He'll play a song like three times in a row. And uh, this is a great example of how a mood of a song can inform the, the direction that your edit goes in some way or another. So I would encourage you to think more out of the box in that sense. But that's it. I would love to hear your thoughts. Please feel free to engage. I hope you have a lovely day. Goodbye.